If you want all the Filmento movie writing lessons in one place, check out the Filmento book, which summarizes the educational points of my past videos into one quickly ingestible place. Water connects all things. The way of water has no end. The way of water is your home. Before your birth and after your death. Avatar The Way of Water is a new movie from James Cameron where blue aliens on a blue alien planet led by Jake Sully get hunted by human soldiers who look like blue aliens so they have to travel out to live with other slightly less blue aliens who have brothers and sisters who are whales or something. Anyway, look at this cool alien shark. <laughs> And the reason I'm explaining all that is because maybe you hadn't heard about this movie since it only made like a couple billion at the box office, which is pretty modest compared to the 300 more billion made by Morbius. Except, oh yeah, there's the currency conversion, so I guess Way of Water was actually pretty successful. And that's not too surprising since it's James Cameron and since the world and visuals here are out of this world. I initially thought that was mostly because of the novelty factor of the high frame rate in theaters, but no, it was the same at home. The first rain sequence makes you gasp in amazement, the water set pieces make you wish that real life water was this realistic, and the third act is unlike anything I've ever seen. It's a true next-gen technology experience. Also added an AI system to it, so we have fish move out of the way when you get close to them. But the curious thing is that all that visual and technological power shouldn't be enough, because the movie is three hours long. That's a long time, it's like three shows, it's very tough to keep the audience interested and willing to be entertained for that long of a straight shot. Like, ice cream is good, but not so much hours in. And that's especially applicable here since there's no 10 year groundwork to earn the audience's attention for that long. We don't really care about anyone or anything in that way here. We don't care about Jake Sully or... Oh, I didn't mean like that. Uh, come on, Jake, I'm, I'm just saying. But still, somehow, somehow, the movie manages to earn your attention regardless in order to be allowed to keep you entertained with the world and the visuals. Just when you think you're getting bored of what you're seeing, they pull me back in again and again. And the secret somehow way it does it is by treating itself like a video game. What I mean by that is that not only is the content of Way of Water designed to service the world like in a lot of video games, the experience is also divided into four levels. The forest level, the water level, the hunting level, and the family level. It's this level mentality that keeps you on board. It's why you stay refreshed for three hours, why you're entertained during that time, and why you're involved emotionally. I've talked about levels and sectioning in a plot sense before, but in today's episode of Monotone Expression Movie Nerd, let's dive into the topic more on the world side. Whether your movie is about a special world or if it's just too goddamn long, here's how treating it like a video game can help you keep the audience on the ride. Easy nerd. Firstly, the way this movie uses level design to keep you refreshed is by presenting new external settings with distinct mechanics and obstacles to define that section of the runtime. In the beginning, Jake Sully is living a happy forest life with his new alien family until, as per usual, the white man shows up to wreak havoc on the planet. Someone coming. Sorry, someone coming. Someone coming. Not only by literally doing so, but also by sending the soldier from the first movie in an avatar body to kill Jake Sully to crush the local resistance. That's the level problem that the content revolves around. We're raiding human supply trains to get weapons to fight back with. We're traversing these dangerous forest areas we shouldn't be in, and we're saving the kids from the soldier forces. It's all pretty cool. Go, go, go! <laughs> And just before you have time to think that the forest actually isn't that cool anymore, we leave it behind 
and enter the water level where the heroes join this water tribe to live in hiding. This second setting now becomes what all the content services, and it's so inherently different from before, visually as well as mechanically, that you're reeled back in. We get this whole new place to explore. We learn about and tour the ocean, meet and interact with new people, discover and interact with new animals. Man, I'm gonna whip this home. Everything is so fresh that even though you've been watching this movie already for 50 minutes, your energy is almost the same as when you first sat down. It's the novelty that recharges you. It's like arriving in a resort in a new country to start the day, even though the day actually started long ago. And again, all that exploration is born from an underlying issue that the section is about overcoming. We must pull our weight to earn our keep. That's what everything that happens is in service of. We need to learn to swim to survive. We need to learn to bond with the animals to function. And we need to make friends with the locals to have a place. <laughs> This necessity to explore the new setting and its mechanics ensures that it's not just an empty visually appealing sandbox. There's a fundamental point to it that gives us a sense of progression as we progress toward the completion of that point and thus this section. Then, once again, just when you start to think that you're over the water life and that it's not actually that exciting, we move to the next level, which is the hunting level. Now, the issue on the villain side is that they know that Jake Sully is on the islands, but they can't find him. They don't know anything. <laughs> And so, to deal with that issue, we delve into a whole new set of mechanics, hunting and combat mechanics. We explore the process of how humans hunt and kill whales and what for. We get introduced to all this marine technology they use in doing so. It's the same water world, yeah, but the gameplay, so to speak, is so different that it's like a whole new thing. And it eventually brings the heroes in to join the hunt. We must hunt this demon, trap him, kill him. At which point, the one-way marine combat gameplay becomes two-way marine combat gameplay. All this water stuff is so different from the earlier water stuff that you see it as this fresh thing and are thus excited to watch it play out as if you just started watching. Then, once the big marine combat has gone on long enough, we move on to the final family level in which Jake Sully has to take the villain head on to finish things once and for all. It's almost like a more intimate boss level. We fight in claustrophobic interiors of steel and metal with just a few main people in a race against time as the ship sinks. It's still the water world, yes, but the visual setting and gameplay is so unlike the prior sections that it's like a whole refreshingly new thing. And then, oh, would you look at that, it's been three hours. Only it doesn't feel like it's been three hours because it's actually been four sections of 45 minutes. I hope you get what I'm getting at, but the point is that this level mentality keeps recharging the viewer to allow them to keep going. Like how in Ghost Protocol, even though the Dubai section is yet another heist, it's so unlike the previous one in terms of visuals and mechanics and logistics that it's freshly exciting. So whether you have a world to showcase or time to combat, ask yourself, what is the next new external setting and what is the problem through which it's explored? Answer that question well and frequently enough and you can keep resetting the audience's internal clock to keep them refreshed and on board. If I still need to be more clear, think of it in a literal video game sense, in that the player goes to the next level to be presented with new surroundings and skills, and they then need to practice and utilize those skills to navigate the surroundings to get to the level after that. Like, oh, you need to go through this ocean door, but you must first learn to speak fish. I have no idea what you just said. And so then in this level, that's the issue you're solving. You navigate and search the surroundings to find a phone. You use the phone to do fun 10 minute interactive fish speaking lessons every day. And then through those lessons, you learn to have a fish conversation in just three weeks. There you go, level complete. On to the next one. <laughs> Oh, and by the way, if you in this way want to learn a language that isn't fish with 10 minutes of work each day, you can do it with Babbel. It's a super efficient and easy to use language app that fits your daily life and teaches you through a variety of non-boring hands-on methods which are designed by real language teachers to get you talking in three weeks. Tal como lo he hecho con mi canal en español. Uh, uh.
The sponsoring a 60% film mentor discount with the link below or by scanning the QR code on screen. So what's the new language level you want to get to? Check it out. Secondly, the way this movie uses level design to keep you entertained, even in slower plot moments, is by populating the sections with side quests to mine activity from. For the most part, the forest level is all plot. The villains are coming for Jake Sully's life, and so he has to rescue his family from harm. There's enough main narrative content to keep creating situations and activity, and thus, entertainment. The issue is that you can't really rely on the main plot for three hours. The audience won't be entertained by three hours of the villains chasing the hero. Oh my god. Oh. For that to work, the narrative would have to be so complex and full of turns and reversals that in most writing hands, it would most likely become convoluted. And accordingly, once we then get to the water level, the plot kind of fades off to the background. The villains aren't really chasing the heroes and the heroes aren't actively running or fighting. Which is a problem since, well, where does the entertainment come from then? How do we get situations and activity and things happening when the plot isn't there to create it? That's right, with side quests. Hello. Best behavior. I mean it. Learn fast, pull your weight. Don't cause trouble. Got it? Yes, sir. Yeah, so as I mentioned before, the water level becomes all about the heroes acquiring necessary skills to earn their keep and making friends to earn their place. We learn to swim and to breathe. We get to know the new surroundings. We try to make peace with other kids, which then leads us to confront a shark and then to develop a bond with a whale. Even though the main plot is frozen, the setting itself offers these sub-level activities to do in the meantime, which is vital because it's really tough to keep the audience entertained with passive characters that sit around doing nothing. As a result of my procedure, I have an overpowering urge to consume. Hey, what's this day of rest? What's this bullshit? I don't fucking care. It don't matter to Not that it's not possible, but realistically, the writers who can make that work possess character skills that are miles beyond 99.9% .9 of other writers. Laughable, man. <laughs> I would have you in the ass Saturday. I'll f you in the ass and next Wednesday instead. Woo! You got a day Wednesday, baby! And most importantly, to ensure that time isn't wasted on paths leading nowhere, all these side quests not only explore the world and its mechanics, but also become key later on. The relationship between the kid and the whale is pretty randomly weird to say the least, but it provides necessary context for the whale hunting in the next level. And even though the whale hunting is a pretty outside the box way for the villains to chase the heroes, <laughs> so is kids. Oh, well, isn't that convenient? It is how they ultimately draw the heroes out. Out. In this manner, while the side quests may not always directly advance the plot, they do ultimately become a fundamental part of the plot. <laughs> the side quests of learning to swim and to deal with ocean animals ultimately become crucial for the kids to stay a step ahead of the villains when they attack. The side quest of exploring the new water world ultimately becomes crucial for how the kids fight back and how they ultimately survive. Those subsections don't necessarily move the needle, but they do play a part in moving the needle. The ocean vehicles become weapons against the heroes. The killer whale becomes a whale that kills. Do they ever fight back? No, I've never seen them lift a fin. No, please. <laughs> And the ocean animal skills become relevant in such a way that no time was wasted. The point I'm trying to get across is that plot is pretty easy in two places. It's easy at the beginning and it's easy at the end, where here for example we have to go in to fight the villain to save the kids. That pretty much writes itself. But the middle is different. The middle with plot is tough. You have to keep the plot active to create situations and make stuff happen, but at the same time, you also have to make the plot last all the way to the third act, which in a long movie isn't so easy, as you may have seen in countless Hollywood blockbusters. 
But as Way of Water shows, it doesn't have to be that tough, because in those sections where you're not able to actively maintain the plot, the level mentality allows you to do just fine without it. Once you have the new external setting, you can populate it with setting-related secondary things to do in place of the main plot, so long as it ultimately serves the main plot once it returns. At the end of the day, in order for the audience to be entertained, you have to find events and activities and situations to entertain them with. Thirdly, the way this movie uses level design to keep you invested emotionally is by basing the sections on constantly evolving internal and relationship status quos. In the first level, for example, to introduce what I'm talking about, the best word I would use to describe the status quo is isolation. That's the current mental and emotional state, so to speak. The hero kids mainly traverse their home that they're familiar with and they pretty much only interact amongst themselves. They want to leave their shell, but Jake Sully doesn't let them. You're supposed to be spotters. You spot bogeys and you call them in. From a distance! Jesus, I let you two geniuses fly a mission and you disobey direct orders. Whereas on the villain side, the human soldier is in this weird middle ground as he gets resurrected as an alien. What the is that a f he doesn't see himself as a real alien, just like neither do the men in his squad, but at the same time, he doesn't think of himself as the same real human either. He won't take ownership of his human son. I'm not that man. That essentially is the current emotional state the movie digs into. That is the area of feelings it makes the audience feel. And when we then get to the water level, that state changes into something I'd call exploration. Now the kids meet other people and explore foreign lands since Jake's Sully has no choice but to let them, and in the process they purposefully get in conflicts and dangers and even fall for a blue person, as we all at some point in life tend to do. Now Jigsuli himself isn't a leader anymore but more so a guest, so he has to bend to the rules of others rather than make his own. Whereas on the villain side, now the soldier starts getting in touch with the alien way of life. Eat Navi, we ride Navi. Think Navi. by learning about their language and customs and ways of doing things. And in the process, he also starts getting closer with his nut son, who in turn now starts interacting with sky people strangers with their own ways rather than with domestic people he already knows. Whoa, hold on there, my guy. You listen up. What I'm getting at is that, as you may notice, even though the main characters are the same as in the previous section, it all feels very different. Relationships are new in terms of power dynamics and attitudes and in how they unfold. Internal mental states are new in terms of who feels what when doing what and with who. Emotionally speaking, it all feels very unlike before. It feels fresh. Same in the hunting level, which I'd call the flip. Now the kids have overcome the conflicts with the local kids to become their friends. Now the whales return in a way that frees up the locals from their hostile reservations toward the heroes. Now the soldier starts playing his tougher cards in a way that forces him to look away from the sun. Now the sun begins to realize that sky people really aren't so great, just like he initially thought. What the hell are you doing? I'm not gonna be part of it. That's right. Don't touch me! Let's go. The villain side becomes more about direct domestic conflict, whereas the hero side becomes more about working together and about us versus them and about what is the right approach. Once again, it's the same characters in the same place, but within a very different internal status quo, with big differences in terms of who we're friends with and who we're fighting and with what power dynamics. And then there's the family level, which I'd call red. That seems to apply on all fronts. Now it's the hero kids on the assault instead of on the run. And as they save their family, one of them dies, which then turns the mom from someone you might search adult material of into someone you have nightmares about. <laughs> Now the soldier has gone so attached to the son that he actually sees him as his son that he values over the mission. Now the son has gone close enough to his dad that even though he knows him to be the enemy, he can't let him die. Now Jake Sully has to accept the fact that his younger boy isn't a boy anymore, but instead a man who can pull his weight on the field. And also that sometimes offense is the best defense even if there's nobody to rescue. Let's get it done. <laughs> Yeah! <laughs> 
The point is that to prevent your movie from getting emotionally stale, you have to keep evolving the emotional state from one section to another in a concrete enough manner for the audience to grasp. And the easiest way to do so is by thinking of it like video games, in that this is the first level of relationships and character mental states, whereas this is the second level of relationships and character mental states, with a difference that's clearly tangibly defined, literally its levels. And if you correctly use that level mentality with this and with the outside world, then with any luck, your movie's three hour runtime will feel like that much less.